Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Female Fight Fans podcast. I'm your host and the founder of Female Fight Fans, Erin McKell. And for today's podcast, I am talking with Stephanie Kent, who is such a cool lady. She has so much going on. She's a writer, um, also a entrepreneur. She's just a creative in general. She's the co-founder of Call Me Ishmael, which is a platform that essentially curates anonymous stories about books um, and actually has people um, like record them into like vintage payphones um, that turn into literary installations, which I'll ask her all about how to explain that. Um, but it's a really fascinating project. And she also has done a lot of work for many different prestigious publications and organizations like TED, The Wall Street Journal, Dow Jones, um, And has also been shortlisted for a Webby Award um, for her online journalism um, and also is the recipient of a National Book Foundation um, Innovators Award um, in the reading category. And besides all of this, as if all of those accomplishments weren't enough, um, she also um, has a BA in playwriting and um, is a fighter and um, an amateur boxer and does all of her boxing training in addition to the many and various other things she does. Um, so without further ado, uh, welcome, Stephanie, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. That was like the nicest introduction. I'm like, grinning ear to ear. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, you are definitely a very accomplished person in general. That's so um, nice to say. Oh, yeah. I mean, gosh, you're welcome. Um, so maybe my first question will be like, how, how do you do it all? And how does boxing <laughs> kind of like fit into that? <laughs> that is a good question. And unfortunately, this week, it's like giving up sleep <laughs> 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 about being balanced um no I just like have always had a lot of interests and a lot of hobbies and I've always really liked to work on a bunch of different things so um I think it sort of like gives me energy and like inspiration to have a bunch of different things going on at once so that's kind of the first thing but um I'm just generally like a pretty or. Person. I'm good at prioritizing and you know like you you kind of make time for what's important yeah definitely um so how did you get into boxing because obviously boxing is very different than sort of all of your other passions and creative talents <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so how did you kind of find yeah, it so and awesome. yeah <laughs> Um, No, it's kind of funny, though. Like, I definitely thought that when I first started boxing that it was this really different thing. But the longer I do it and the more I pay attention to it, it's so fascinating to me, like, how much it's actually a lot like other things in life that um, that maybe in ways that you wouldn't expect. But um, I got started boxing in 2013. Um, I had this really weird rough year where um there were a lot of people in my life who were fighting cancer and uh, my mom actually had a cancer scare um she thankfully is okay and everything worked out fine but I had this really like just scary moment of um just feeling like it was like this horrible disease that was like closing in around me so I really wanted to do something proactive to kind of combat it mm-hmm. and I'm not a scientist <laughs> but um but I wanted to raise some money for cancer research and so I found this program called Haymakers for Hope and I actually found it like really randomly love like, the like, name a, yeah it's such <laughs> a good a name. Great name um yeah they um I signed up like randomly through some email newsletter I was on and I think I kind of signed up because I really wanted to like I said raise money but I hate running so I didn't want to do a marathon oh yeah yeah like the joke's on me because you have to run so (laughs) (laughs) but um but yeah it was just this amazing experience I um it's like three or four months you sign up in the summer they uh, pair you with a trainer like a legit fighting trainer um and you get to go to a gym and get personal training for three months and then the sort of culminating event while you're getting all these people to sort of like donate and support you is a big fight night in new york city in front of like 1500 people oh my gosh. Ballroom. they have like a pro announcer there it's like really they treat it like this really beautiful real fight 
And so, yeah, I did that program and I just loved it so much. It was the best experience of my life. I didn't even win my fight and it was still the best night of my life. Like I, I just loved the energy of it. I loved how much it tests you. I love how much respect everybody has for fighters and for boxing. And uh, yeah, I've been going pretty much every day since then. <laughs> That's amazing. That's such a cool yeah. story. Yeah. And Haymaker is like, I can't say enough good things about I'm I actually work with them quite a bit. I write for their blog and volunteer. I would do anything that they ever asked of me. They just do such good work. They raise so much money for cancer research. And um, I think they do an amazing job of helping people get into the sport that they love too. That's amazing. Yeah, I love that because it really, I, and I love that the passion that you had in wanting to raise money for cancer research kind of led you into another passion. And I love the whole idea and the whole connection of making a program like that. And also, um, it's cool that it, it culminated in such a really big way in front of like a huge crowd. And um, it just, yeah, it sounds amazing. Yeah, it was so fun that I had like, I just no one in my life really did anything like boxing. Like I didn't really do a ton of sports growing up. And in college, I was way more sort of bookish and theatrical. <laughs> athletic. And I think when I signed up, I was like, maybe doing yoga once or twice a month like I was in like probably bad worse shape than I knew and then boxing is I'm sure you know is like the most cardio thing you have to be so fit oh, yeah. so strong and your willpower and your mental capacity has to be really on point so it was a it was a, a journey to learn about it really quickly and feel like there was this kind of like looming event that I knew I was gonna have a fight and I was gonna have to fight in front of you know, over a thousand people. It's a good way right. to like scare you into working really hard. <laughs> Absolutely. And do you think that because, and I definitely have experienced this too, where um, the dedication and the passion and how you have to really push yourself and test your own limits can carry over to other areas of your life. So do you feel like, totally. yeah, do you feel like it helps you in your career, in your relationships? Do you think the the principles that you've learned from boxing kind of carry over into other things? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I was just talking to one of my, um, one of my teammates about this the other day. There's like this sense in boxing that you know, it's so different than most areas of our lives. Like most people sort of work in jobs that I think they're kind of not, not naturally good at, but you know, you work in industries that you're like pretty comfortable with. There's right. not a lot in the average working person's day to day life that like really tests you and makes you have to like decide if you're going to quit or keep coming back. And like, you know, I've been boxing for years now and I had a bad sparring day the other day. I was just like, had an off day I wasn't listening to my coach while I wasn't doing well and it's so frustrating and like the easiest thing in the world would be to just not do it anymore like I'm not getting paid to go I would way rather be sleeping in I would way rather be eating junk food <laughs> but, you know you just sort of like learn about sacrifice and you learn about hard work and you learn about being humbled all the time because it's a sport that I think for the majority of us, no matter how much you practice it, there's always something to learn. You can always get better. You can always get faster. You can always get stronger. And so it's sort of like a, it's a, you know, a challenge, like just this feeling that there's something that you love and you work at every day and you think about all the time and you'll never be able to master it all the way. Like there's always going to be room for improvement. That's a, a good thing to have in your life, I think. Yeah, yeah that's so true because you never really like reach the top, even if you're yeah. right. Yeah. So, and talk to me a little bit um, about kind of like how, like, what is your kind of day-to-day -day training like? And also kind of how does that fit into your actual work and all of the other things that you do? Um, do you have like a certain training schedule um, where you like run this many times a week, spar this many times a week, um, yeah. you know, strength train this many times a week? How do you kind of structure um, your boxing Totally. So I work out at Mendez Boxing, um, which is in New York City yeah. in the Flatiron District. And it's a pretty like old school boxing gym. Like we don't do really any classes or anything like that. So I work out with um, my coach, who's the one I just totally randomly got paired with when I signed up for Haymakers. And um, he coaches a bunch of other women. So it's kind of fun that we have this sort of team of girls that all work out together, um, which is really rare. Like I mean, maybe it's better in other 
parts of the world. <laughs> York, there's just not a ton of female fighters. So it's like really nice to have like 10 different sparring partners that are all women. Like it's, um, it's really good experience. It's really, um, valuable for sparring and for having exposure to lots of different styles and sizes and people. Um, but it's also really nice for like accountability because, you know, there's all these people that are relying on you to show up and help each other and support each other and encourage each other every day. So I do like six days a week there. Um, we take Sundays off, we do sparring three days a week and, um, and just sort of boxing workouts the other days and, um, cardio we all sort of do on our own so I try to run two or three times a week when I'm being really good and when I'm sort of wow that's such an intense schedule oh my gosh yeah so I do it a lot but I go every morning at six in the morning which sounds really extreme but like and I didn't really used to be a morning person before I started boxing but it's like the best start to your day like the days that I oversleep or don't have time or you know, have to get in a meeting or I'm traveling. Like I feel really incomplete without it. It's just like the most meditative way to start your day. It's so nice to just sort of like get your body awake and get your muscles moving and get your mind sort of sharpened first thing. It's like the days I don't go, I'm like my worst self. Like I'm so grouchy and I feel like I have too much energy. Like I, I can't imagine starting my way without it. <laughs> That's so amazing though. Wow. Um, Cause I feel like especially and maybe this is just like my impression, but I feel like for people in who aren't like professional boxers who are like in the amateurs technically, they might train like a, like maybe like three days a week, like actually like at their boxing gym and then um, you know doing running and those kind of things, conditioning. But I'm like, oh my gosh, girl, you're there six oh, days a week. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> No, I mean, that sounds lovely. My coach is so crazy. Like, if I miss one day and go, like, five days a week, he's like, what's the matter with you? Like, what, you think you don't need the practice? There's a lot of pressure to show up, so it's good. That's great, though. Yeah. Um, And so how long have you actually been boxing for, and what kind of, what's kind of been your experience? Like, have you won any titles? How many fights have you had? What's kind of... Um, do you have anything coming up? Like how, like, tell me a little bit about sort of the backstory of that. Yeah. So I guess I've been about five years now. Yeah. I guess this fall will be, we'll make it five years. And, um, I've had, I guess four or five fights, um, no titles. I haven't done any of the bigger tournaments in New York. Um, mostly just the sort of like show fights around here. But, um, yeah, it's kind of funny. So after my Haymakers fight, which, again, that was, like, three months into boxing, we had this, like, huge sanctioned event. Um, I kind of went back and, like, really spent, like, two years not fighting at all and just kind of, like, just learning on the basics. Yeah, because I think if you start boxing, like, signed up for a fight like that, you kind of have to train in, like, triage mode <laughs> because <laughs> uh, I think from, I mean, I'm sure there are people that are just really natural at it, and especially if you've done a lot of other sports in your life, like, the footwork and things come really naturally, but I think for the most of us, like, there's, it takes a long time to pick up the technique, like, there's so much about boxing that's just awkward for people that don't, like, train themselves, like, you don't want to keep your chin down and lean forward when somebody's punching at you you want to like turn around or like run away so like you have to just kind of like train all of your instincts and I think that for most of us that takes time so I really spent um, a couple years just kind of like going back from zero and um, really working on my jab. I'm um, on the taller end for my weight class. I fight at um, 141 and I'm 5'10". So I spent a lot of time sort of learning about using my reach and really getting a good strong jab that not only kind of can out a bunch but really working on making it like a strong powerful punch um and I, that just kind of took time so that was um that was right after the haymakers fight and then i've had a couple other fights since then um but i also travel a lot for work um as you <laughs> said in your beautiful introduction to my resume <laughs> I sort of do a lot of different things and um i get um sort of around the country and around the world a lot and so one of the things about fighting is you need to be really dedicated to it like even if you're in fantastic shape like the day of a fight just your nerves are going and all the adrenaline and even if you're in really good shape you're still gonna get really tired so right. you have to be kind of in the gym for a couple months leading up to a fight and or I want to be anyways so um it's been a little tricky to schedule but um for now just keeping up with lots of sparring and hoping next year I'll get I'll get a few more yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and I want to talk a little bit also about like your 
writing because you've combined your passion for boxing and fighting in general um, with your yeah. career with because you've done lots of different freelance pieces for Bad Left Hook and SB Nation. Um, I know you did you did this really cool piece on reviewing different um, boxing gyms in Denver. So even like yeah. combining your uh, travel like with the writing and the boxing. Um, so how did you kind of first decide to sort of fuse the two passions together and um yeah and, and you've done a couple pieces on conor mcgregor too so i kind of want to ask you also about <laughs> him and obviously everything that's upcoming <laughs> yeah um so i when i was getting ready for my fight um my i got married last year but um, at the time it was my boyfriend um was like so supportive like he like got up early every morning with me and would like walk me to the gym when it was still dark out and we watched all the rocky movies because i'd never seen any of them and just kind of like made it this fun side project since like i wasn't drinking and i wasn't really eating uh yummy junk food anymore we kind of just like threw ourselves into like, <laughs> learning about boxing culture which was really fun and um one of the things is um, we started reading a bunch of books about boxing and there's an author called Joyce Carol Oates who um, who wrote a book called, I think it's called On Boxing and um, just sort of like gives this cool nonfiction overview of the sport and writes about it in such a beautiful way and so it made me sort of like go down this weird reading path of like just being obsessed with everyone that's ever written about boxing and it's like actually surprisingly like a really literary sport like it's written about even like from um you know sports journalists and people writing from like a more newsy perspective it just has like a really beautiful language and the way people describe the fights is very dramatic and very narrative and so it has this just kind of like fun quality that lends itself really well to writing so I got just sort of obsessed with reading about boxing um and then, yeah, as I started to learn more about the sport, you know, I didn't really grow up watching boxing, so I don't have, like, a ton of the historical knowledge that, like, lifelong boxing fans have. Right. Um, so, like, I'm always still, like, in catch-up mode, like, <laughs> about, like old boxers and, like, watching old fights. Um, but just sort of noticed how everybody writing about boxing is a man, and I was like, you know, I love this sport, and I noticed a lot of things about it, and so I thought it would be fun to kind of learn more about what it would be like to cover sports uh, boxing journalism um so yeah i started i guess my first piece would have been one of the bad left hook ones um and i did a bunch of coverage for them for the mayweather mcgregor fight a while back and yeah it was fun i don't know that much about mma like everything i know about it is kind of like through the lens of boxing so it was just super fascinating to like <laughs> kind of brush up on like what his history was and learn about like where he came from and then think about like how it fit into a boxing world but it was actually a really good i think kind of like first project to work on in terms of writing just because like a lot of the ways i approached it was like how would somebody that didn't know the MMA world as much or didn't know the boxing world as much like what would they want to learn about yeah. what would they want to know about in order to right. be excited for the fight so because I felt like I was kind of a newbie both in terms of like actually officially writing about boxing for the first time but also literally like <laughs> learning about <laughs> MMA for the first time it was kind of a cool perspective I think to bring to it so it was fun to do a few of those pieces I agree no I totally agree and by the way I wouldn't know it from actually reading them because oh. um, I was like you know it's like all I was like oh she does about MMA <laughs> um, and and it's funny you say that too kind of going back to um, like there's not a lot of girls in the sports journalism space that was kind of like one of the first things that catalyzed me into starting female fight fans because I was looking to kind of follow um some just like follow a platform that was more like female driven and I couldn't find one I couldn't find one I and like for like months I really just like came up short and I was like oh like I it just kind of dawned on me one day I was like oh it must like there this whole like platform must not really exist out there yet yeah. and um and so that kind of got me interested into starting it myself since I also have a lot of writing experience and um I've done quite a bit of freelancing so um yeah so I, I kind of like fused all my passions together into it but yeah like there's definitely not enough women I don't think in the space and um it also is kind of interesting to me because I feel like th th there's lots of and boxing is I think very different than MMA in this respect but there's so many women in MMA now um 
but still not so much in like sort of the background like the even you know in terms of like promoters or kind of people working behind the scenes in some way um it's still very male dominated so yeah, and it's funny right because it's such like an interconnected problem like part of the reason it's really hard for women in boxing to get sort of sponsorship and time on television with their fights and um, get paid fairly is because not enough people are covering them but that's because the same types of people have been covering them for you know the history of the sport right so I like to think that it sort of all helps fuel itself that if there are more women whose companies are sponsoring boxers then they're going to be more female boxers they're going to be more women to cover them and hopefully it'll all sort of um, equal out eventually definitely yeah I I definitely I'm fully in agreement with that and I think all the efforts on every single person's part ends up contributing to the greater picture and the ideal and and I think too like the more because I think part of the whole like problem with um especially in boxing women still fighting to just even get coverage and to get sponsorships and to just have a spot on tv has to, goes back to like how they're being covered too because I think men tend to talk about women in sports a lot differently than women talk about women in sports totally. right and so I think that that also kind of it just fuels this um a lot of the myths and the sort of problematic thinking that's still out there which is that like women aren't as tough as men they're not their fights are boring you know they're not as talented of fighters they're not um and it may be, like, physiologically they're not as strong, but, like, it, the actual, like, courage and strength, like, that carries over into the ring or to the cage is definitely equal in spirit, totally. right? And and skill and, you know, just all these things. Um, and a lot of times, too, I think uh, people tend to focus on female fighters who are either, like, a phenomena for some reason or because they're pretty. And it still kind of, you know, it fuels this whole thing that, like there's a couple women who are interesting who are fighting but you know the majority still kind of get like pushed to the side yeah did you see clarissa shields tweet about the michaela mayer fight no what did she say because i know i know that they're friends and i follow both of them (laughs) yeah it was my favorite i like i want to print out a copy of it she was like i'm watching espn and the announcer says michaela mayer is beautiful and she's like i hate that she's beautiful because she has a great jab and she knows how to use her reach not because of what she <laughs> oh my gosh that's so, that's so funny because i was thinking that too like watching because i did watch it on espn um and yeah and i like and it's true i don't know if you watched the michaela mayer fight last weekend but she the, the announcer Oh, like all they were talking about was like oh my gosh like she's so pretty and um you know yeah. she has the look and like oh, like they weren't even really talking about the fight yeah. like as it was happening so weird. <laughs> I know and like that would never happen like for the guys I know can you imagine <laughs> right like, man triple g's looking handsome tonight <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I definitely think that, um, like, the more women kind of on all ends who contribute and, like, break into these spaces and break the barriers down, the better for everyone. And the whole sport kind of benefits from um, just having it be more gender egalitarian. Yeah, I totally agree. So that brings me, so let's talk a little bit about, like, fighting and watching combat sports in general because I so now I know you're not really somebody that watches MMA although I would I'm not, I watch like the big ones that just because like I think UFC does such an amazing job of like building up their fighters and making the shows feel like this thing that you can't miss that everyone's going to be talking about and so like I definitely like kind of fall victim to to their big shows but I don't really keep up with it outside of that so, speaking of big shows, are you are you planning to watch uh, Connor versus Khabib? And obviously, you have a little bit of knowledge or investment into Connor from covering him a little bit in the Mayweather McGregor build up last year. Um, so, yeah, do you think you'll watch it? Yeah, I probably will. Mostly just because I think it's super fascinating how you could take you know time off like that and then like go right back into it and he's like talking as much trash as one more like <laughs> spectacle of it like I, I kind of feel like you sort of can't look away from him um but that being said like I know so little about his opponent and um I don't think I'm gonna like give a ton of my brain space but I'll definitely enjoy it and 
check out the undercard. Yeah, cool. Um, well, I, I'll tell you just like a little bit. So, because Khabib yeah, essentially, give me the, give me the. It, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's it's a really interesting stylistic matchup too, which I think is also why people are really interested because it's not like just the history and the beef and even you know Connor kind of being somewhat mysterious and that he hasn't fought in MMA for like two years and you know. Um, obviously the whole Floyd Mayweather fight and I think that broke a little bit of his mystique and things like that um, and you know even the fact that he doesn't have to take this fight he's rich enough to yeah, never work to again, again right <laughs> yeah and so obviously it's something that is for passion and I think also he wants to prove a point so it, but stylistically it's very much like a striker grappler matchup because Khabib is this like monster wrestler who just like takes people down he calls it like the Khabib smash and that's kind of like <laughs> he's Russian too Beautiful. so yeah and it's like literally like that's what happens like he gets on top of people and, they, and you know he just has this like vicious ground and pound and like and, and even like he um I think has this aura of invincibility because he's 26 and 0 which in MMA people don't really have undefeated records often and especially I've never heard somebody being 26 and 0 um and he's like never even lost a round in his entire career so he's so dominant um and just has like all this momentum going behind him and, and he's fought you know great it's not like he hasn't fought like top caliber guys so um so I think like and you know he's been and he also has been like has had some injuries and stuff and like is kind of known to like pull out of fights um so I think that there's like an, an element of that too in terms of like he's been he hasn't been like super active either necessarily um so yeah so that's kind of like the the actual matchup so I think like stylistically too it's going to be it's like okay can Connor kind of use his footwork and you know land his left hand or is Khabib going to be able to take him down um and so who, two questions who yes. do you think will win and who do you want to win oh that's like I always have a, I always have a want pick and like a who I think will actually win yeah. first. <laughs> so who do I want to, maybe I'll go who I think will win first so I, it's weird, my gut instinct actually tells me Connor's gonna win, which makes no sense to me, and, like, the, <laughs> the general, and I'll tell you, too, like, the general opinion in the MMA community is that Con or that Khabib is going to, like, easily be able to dispose of Connor. Like, it's gonna probably take him, but, like, the, I think, cause one of the things people talk about is, like, oh, Connor's cardio is really bad, um, and, you know, he's just, like, he just doesn't have the ground game to, like, deal with Khabib, essentially. So, that's good. So, Khabib is the batting favorite, and, like, most people think he's going to win. Um, so, but some reason, like, my gut instinct tells me it's going to be Connor. Okay. And <laughs> so, and who do I want to win? Uh... I kind of want Khabib to win. Um, I like... Are you, like, very invested in either of them? Like, do you follow... Not super... Or? Yeah, not really. I'm not super invested in either. Um, like, I've started following Khabib more because I think he's just really fast. Like, his whole... Like, he's just so fascinating because there's just no one like him. Um in MMA, like, there just isn't, like, there's nobody, like, there's nobody who's 26 and 0, there's nobody that has, like, the style that he has, really, it's just, I, he's so interesting to me, um, and even just the whole, like, it, he's, like, Dagestani, and just all of, like, I just, it's so, it's so fascinating to me, his whole really? kind of, yeah, um, and because there's even this whole drama with, like, because, uh, Vladimir Putin like had Conor McGregor as his guest to the, at the World Cup, and, and yeah, so and so he had Conor as his like guest of honor, and Khabib was actually at the World Cup too, but like that, but people were like, so why wasn't Khabib his guest? Because there's this whole thing of like which I learned about after, which is because I guess like because technically Khabib is Russian, but he like he calls himself Dagestani, which is like. It's not, like, a real country. It's kind of like um, in Ireland. I'm forgetting the exact, like, terminology, but um, kind of like how... Or maybe Canada, like, that is a better example. Like, how Quebec, like, they think of themselves as, like, the separate state, but they're actually not. Okay. And, it, you know, it's kind of like that. Um, and so the Russians and the Dagestanis have sort of an ongoing feud. So that was, like, a way for Putin to, like, essentially... Um, like insult the Dagestanis by having Connor 
as his guest of honor. That sounds so unlike him. <laughs> so, I know, and then it just added to the whole, like, you know, drama of it all, and um, the beef that exists between them. So, yeah, I don't really have, like, but I've gotten a little bit, ever since UFC 223, um, that was the first, like, live fight I ever watched of Khabib, and, um, yeah, I've kind of been, like, following him since then. But, yeah, I'm not, like, super invested, but, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, you've gotten me ex- more excited about Yay! it. So Yay! You should at least get, like, some marketing dollars. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, I love, um, I love MMA, and MMA is my first kind of, like, I, I love MMA a lot more than I love boxing, and um, although I appreciate boxing for what it is, I just love that, I feel like boxing is so traditional, and it gets in its own way a lot of the time because of that, because it's like, everything is so, like, old school in the sense of, like, this is how we do things, and, yeah. like, nobody wants to change, like, even if there's a good reason to, <laughs> and, right. um, and Definitely I, older. right? But I will say it because I feel like now I have to like defend. You did yes. <laughs> <laughs> like I do think there's something really beautiful about how like pure and classic it is, though. And like one of the things, like even just as an athlete, I think about trying UFC or like I mean trying MMA or like trying to learn another combat sport. And I'm like, how in the world could I even think about like getting a new set of skills and like getting into a whole new discipline when I still have so many things to perfect. So I like respect about MMA that there's like this sort of like humongous toolbox and there's so many things that could happen and there's so many surprises with it but I also like will always really love that about boxing that it's just like so pure and so specific and even though there's like way less things that could happen like there's still infinite things that could happen and I think that's really beautiful and nice and sort of like weirdly sometimes feels like an antidote to the like world right now where there's so many things going on and everybody has like no attention span and we all sort of just read headlines like boxing feels like this whole other world that's sort of more classic and I really like that oh I no I actually I really appreciate that because yeah you're right like the world right now and maybe it's even sort of a metaphor like talking <laughs> literary terms for uh, kind of the state of the world right because even like things used to be a lot more simple and yeah boxing okay. is a very purest sport right it's it's a simple although it's very complicated in yeah. reality like it's a simple kind of like you know these six punches and um you, and yeah that's it you know there's not really like you kind of know what to expect um and like what the rules are and like what you're gonna see if you're watching people box but um and we live in such a complicated world where there's so many choices and you know uh, like decision fatigue is a really big thing people are talking about and how we're just kind of always bombarded with things all the time and you know like new is better and that whole kind of mentality versus um boxing kind of I think represents like more simplicity and like sticking to even things like sticking to the basics and what works because yeah, and there's and, like an elegance to it too, yeah I think, that it's just um well I mean everybody like staying on their feet the whole time I think. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah there's this um there's this quote from that Joyce Carol Oates book I was talking about on boxing she says um life is like boxing but boxing is only like boxing <laughs> Oh, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think about that a thousand times a day. No, yeah. So, like, yeah, so I I appreciate your rebuttal on that point. And I think, I definitely think there's room for both, though, for sure. Totally. Um, And, yeah. So, so kind of, like, speaking of that, I want to know, like, who are some of your favorite fighters? And, like, how much do you watch, like, boxing fights? And do you watch mostly women's boxing? Or is it just kind of, like, does not matter what gender the fighters are? Like, what's kind of your boxing viewership habits yeah I mean I there's more professional male boxing out there just generally so I definitely watch a lot of that but I do try to be really active about like seeking out professional women fighters to watch and support and tweet about and buy tickets to and um I try really hard to be super purposeful about that um we talked about Michaela Mayer. I love her. I love yes. watching every single one of her fights. She did a media workout at my gym, and I was like, she's, like, so incredible to watch in oh real life. Oh, my gosh. That's so cool. Yeah. 
Um, so she's definitely up there. There's a fighter out of my gym, actually, um, called Alicia Napoleon. Um, oh, yeah. She's, yeah, she's amazing to watch. And when I first started boxing, like, they called it sparring. But really, she just sort of, like, moved around and barely hit me. But I sparred <laughs> <with her. laughs> And that was, like, my claim to fame. So, um, so I love watching her. She just had a really beautiful fight. With Hannah um, Rankin. Katie. What did you say? I said with Hannah Rankin. Yeah, with Hannah Rankin, that's right. Um, and that was, like, a great We fight. covered it Actually, a little bit. <laughs> but I went and saw her fight. She was out in Long Island, which is kind of a trek from from the city where I live and um the fight actually wasn't televised and it wasn't on the undercard it was like at the end of the night I, yep. was, like really crappy spot like people were like leaving and it was like the best fight of the night like every card on every show on that undercard was so abysmal like it was so boring and then she was the best one got no television time got no promotion it's just like a shame to me so um so she puts on good fights but um I also love Katie Taylor in Ireland yeah. this is amazing yeah so because we actually covered the whole Alicia Napoleon and um oh, I, yeah. yeah yes we did and I actually I have a writer um who um he, he's like everywhere all the time he um and it's actually a guy um but he's like really passionate about covering like um, the women's aspect and giving them more spotlight and um, so he was at the fight and was telling me like all, he was telling me all about that and how it got pushed to like after the main event and all that stuff and yeah people were leaving and um, it wasn't on TV you know even though it was for a world title and all you know all that stuff so yeah that's such a shame and she's am- I think she too has so much like charisma and star power yeah. and she, ugh, I, I love Alicia Napoleon I think I love like everything that she stands for um and I want to hear too like wh- what do you think about um that a lot of people are talking about Michaela Mayer and, and Katie Taylor maybe fighting each other um since I I don't I, I think they are in the same division um if I'm not yeah. mistaken so yeah, that's what I've heard too although I also heard that um Michaela Mayer was going down a weight class for a little bit um so, but they're they were in the same weight in Olympics, and yes. I think that seems like a natural matchup. For some reason, I don't think their number of fights is that different. But for some reason, it's it not. seems like Katie Taylor's been in the pros longer, so it seems like there's something of like leveling out there. Just that, um, I mean, Michaela Mayer hasn't fought for a world title at all, so it would probably be good to see her. Um, and get a few more fights before that but I would love that that would be like Christmas to me to watch that. <laughs> right that's what I think I'm like that would be such a good fight yeah. and I think they're Although both every undefeated every time I watch one of their fights I usually watch um, any big television fight I'll watch with my coach and a bunch of the girls on my team and we'll be watching he's like why don't you jab like that that's how you have to jab and I'm like I would love to jab like that <laughs> <laughs> so I'm also like anticipating how much I'm gonna get yelled at when I watch that oh fight. my gosh that's so funny well yeah I think they're both like they're just so good it's amazing it, and like watching them fight other people they make they make their opponents look like complete amateurs Nothing. which I, yeah. right which is like how hard and like just how much skill level it takes to be able to make someone look silly who's been training for maybe over 10 years um it you know it's just it it's phenomenal and I think gives like I know I always am like wow I have like so much respect and just admiration for like how they're able to do that and right oh my gosh and I I hope like and and I feel like part of the whole like women's boxing thing I think there's not enough there's not enough like big super fights like that and that's like one of the things because I think in MMA like if if they if people want to see two people fight like they kind of make it happen there's not like these crazy politics and stuff for the most part you know is in and in boxing there's so many different like there's so much red tape around everything that I I think the business around MMA far outweighs boxing like it just seems so cohesive and things move really quickly and I really admire that about the sport totally um and kind of going off of that in terms of I do there's definitely women's boxing is definitely gaining momentum even though it still has so much farther to go um you know we're seeing um women's boxing on tv consistently which wasn't even happening at all like five years ago um women's boxing like wasn't even on tv like ever and now you know it's happened like Michaela Mayer was on ESPN and Clarissa Shields um, seems to fight on Showtime every time she fights now. Um, 
and so it, it's definitely happening, although it's still slow. Um, do you think that there is, like, some momentum that's happening? Like, do you feel like it's shifting a little bit? Um, it seems like it to me. I mean, the, you know, that there have only been two Olympics where women could even compete, I think, is something that's changing that really quickly, just that there are these people that have been on a world stage and kind of have notoriety and are in this really elite class of Olympians and being able to like watch them move over to professional boxing, I think is really important and was one of the disadvantages before. So I think so, but I mean, it's still too rare. Like that it's like a big deal if a woman's on an undercard and a really big deal if a woman's on television is just like still so unbalanced. So I think it has a ways to go. Definitely. Um, so this kind of goes a little bit back off to talking about like books and like being academic <laughs> but like you and I both are like this so um because I I want to like ask you like what do you think about kind of like the philosophy of because a lot of people say that um the most intelligent fighters are the ones that succeed the most because you like it's a it's a thinking man's sport even though people sort of stereotype it or think about it as just being kind of brutal and barbaric but in actuality it takes a lot of intellect to actually um you know and even things like not taking shots and you know just like fighting with sort of like a cerebral approach versus just kind of you know brawling and like going crazy um like what do you think about like do you think that that's true in terms of like um like fighters like fighting intelligently like that being a really big advantage or even difference between like people who succeed and people who don't um like how do you kind of think like does being cerebral even like help you at all in terms of um like kind of your approach to boxing yeah I mean I think it's so different right because in amateur fighting which I do like it's you have so much less time and it's so much about being aggressive and you know there are way fewer knockouts so I think there's like definitely something to be said for being aggressive and sort of putting on um the show that you're the one that wants to fight more but I do think that there's like a ton to be said about understanding a plan and being able to stick with it and being able to adjust um, but then in the professionals, it's totally different, right? Like you need to be smart. Otherwise you're going to get really hurt and you need to be able to adapt and you need to like have a game plan that's longer than, you know, six or eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do think like for me and like my experience, like there is something to be said about like that getting in your way a little bit. Like I definitely, one of my biggest problems is like overthinking things. Like I can kind of like get myself like worked up and frustrated and, um, be sort of like over analyzing. So for me personally, I think it's like finding this like middle place of just like trusting your body and your muscle memory to do what it needs to do, but also being aware and being able to like understand what's going on around you and be able to take in a lot of information really quickly, whether it's during a fight or sparring or from your coach in the corner and, um, sort of balancing all of that out yeah oh I like that um so I also want to ask you if you have any favorite books or any books that have kind of inspired you or helped you um or you know just kind of made an impact on you that are like boxing based or martial arts based um yeah yeah, like do you have yeah tell me oh yes I love um I read a lot of biographies about athletes in general but um but specifically around fighters. And I feel sort of weird even saying it because it's not the best book I've ever read, but I thought Ronda Rousey's Me too! So fascinating. Like, it was... I learned so much. And just, like, you see, like, what a like freak she is, just the way that she thinks and the way she talks to herself and the way she bounces back from things. Like, I learned a ton from that book. That being said, like, the lit snob in me is like horrified I just said it because I think it's not the most literary (laughs) (laughs) actually the first book I ever read about boxing is called the power of one and it's by an author called Bryce Courtney and he's um he's South African and it's also a film but I haven't seen the movie but it's this really beautiful novel about South Africa and politics and race and boxing and it's so beautiful and just sort of like really captures the heart of like how much courage and bravery you need to have in the sport and in life and it's one of my favorites 
Love it. And it's so funny you mentioned Ronda Rousey's book because I was thinking about <laughs> leading in with this, but then I decided not to um, because that's actually how I discovered like combat sports in general. Oh, that's was, so interesting. Yeah. And it, through a book, like that's so not a common thing at all. <laughs> so yeah. it's so funny though, but there's so much, like there's so much literature around boxing. Like I was a lit major and, and also studied playwriting and I had never read any of Ernest Hemingway's pieces about boxing and there's a ton of it. He has this like crazy obsession with boxing and, um, uh, what's it called? With Matador's bull, bullfighting. <laughs> and, um, he just writes about them like both really beautifully and it actually has me super inspired and, uh, starting to work on a novel about boxing and so oh. i've been just sort of like collecting everything i can find where somebody writes about the story of boxing okay that sounds really because there's definitely not enough novels or fiction around fighting for sure yeah. um so and that kind of like i wanted to ask you this anyway so like what do you kind of see for like for your future in terms of like what's kind of your ideal in terms of um like like how far do you want to go in terms of actually boxing yourself like um do you think maybe you would want to fight in something like the golden gloves and even like this novel like tell me like kind of your ideal um scenario for yourself like over the next like couple of years yeah I mean I will keep boxing as long as I'm like healthy and able to I I love it so much sometimes I think about being old (laughs) having to give it up and it makes me so sad so I'll box as long as I'm able to but um but yeah in terms of fighting next year I'm actually trying to really actively stay uh, travel a little bit less and be able to be in the gym more and um yeah just starting to think about like other ways to kind of bring boxing into my work um I did a couple of um like live Q and A's on Facebook last year with different folks around boxing, which was super interesting and scary and fun. Um, so I'd like to do a couple more things like that and keep going with the writing. Very nice. And tell us where we can find all your stuff um, and all of the links. Also, for everyone listening, I will include in the show notes as well, so you don't have to like scour Google and like typing these things in. <laughs> um, no, I'm uh, Steph Kent at most places on the internet. So pretty much anything, any place you can have a profile of Steph Kent. Very nice. And this was such a great episode and I love talking to you so much. Me too. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. Oh yeah. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, to everyone listening, thank you for supporting the show and tuning in. Make sure to rate and review if you enjoy the podcast. And um, if you're listening on the website, we do also have um, an iTunes account that you can subscribe to as well. So make sure to do that. And um Thanks again, Stephanie, for being here, and I will see everyone next time, and take care.